Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Just a short introduction to help explain you who I am and why I worked on OSINT. First, I'm a former member of the French Fleet Air Arm. It means that I was on the plane from the French Navy. I was a radar specialist, but I was involved and dedicated to the safety of my plane. It means that I have to decide the height of the plane so that we are not shot by the missiles coming from the ground. When I left the army, I worked and I dedicated myself to fear of flying. People who are afraid of flying, I just wanted them to love flying. So I started to work on crash. I created a fear flying treatment center and I tried to explain all those things. But when you have a crash and when you have a community of people who are afraid of flying, you cannot expect to wait two months to have an answer of, of why it won't happen to them tomorrow. So I started working on open source intelligence first because it was my passion, but also because I was working when I left the army at the, um, the COGIC, which is the Emergency Services Crisis Center, where I was dedicated to developing the open source intelligence. It was not called OSINT in that time, but basically we, were, we, we had hundreds of people working with us just to help for the crisis management. Maybe it will be for next year's um, show. So, we're going to deal with aviation because you know we have a lot of information coming from the internet thanks to uh, the planes because planes basically they share lots of data and of course you can gather them. So we have four kinds of information that we use uh, in crash investigation in open source. Of course you have all those pictures. So for example when you have a film, a webcam, a movie, someone who takes a picture, it's very interesting. If you have a picture from inside a plane where you lost the, the, the door, of course it can give you information about what was uh, destroyed. Um, for example, on the top left uh, picture, it's a piece of the MH370. We see this, we identify this. It was a huge work, but we managed to identify which kind of piece it was just thanks to that. And now we have something funny that people, sometimes they're in the plane and they just choose to pay $5 to go online and to say, woohoo, I'm in the plane, we lost the pressure, I'm going to die, just to have a buzz. And so now we have live tracking about bad stuff coming in the plane. We don't have to wait for someone to tweet. My GPS, it doesn't know if I'm arrived. Shut up. And, for example, a very specific case that we had, maybe you remember a few years ago, three or four years ago, there was a plane that, was, that crashed, a Ukrainian plane, a Boeing 737, that crashed in Iran. And Iran said, this plane was a mess, it was not co correctly maintained, but people took pictures of all the wreckage on the ground, and they shared these pictures of two heads of rockets of uh, TOR system, TOR defense, air defense system. And so, of course, Iran uh, claimed that it was uh, because uh, Ukrainian planes were not reliable and everybody knew that it was because they shot the plane because it was a mistake on their side. So this is just crowdsourcing and people who witness what they see. Second kind of information uh, comes from the dedicated websites and you have lots of database and lots of information. Maybe the most famous one uh, is Flight Radar 24, but you have lots of different kind of websites, sometimes dedicated to military flights. And for example, that's how you can follow the flights coming along the Black Sea just to follow the Ukrainian and uh, Russian war. So you have those information. Up here you have also the instant, the instant speed of the plane, the height of the plane, very lots of information, and more and more you have live ATC. It means that you can now you can just connect yourself to the Chicago airport and listen to live ATC what they are talking about on uh, around the airport. And so if there's a problem, of course, you can listen to it. After that, you have all the information coming from the, uh, the weather services, all the satellites that you can have. And uh, for example, the aviation safety network, when there's a problem with the plane, you can look at the history of the plane. Did he have an issue? Who owned it before? Who operates it? And it can be, of course, very interesting. After that, you have the official data. The official data, of course, they can be openly uh, shared, but sometimes it's not voluntary. For example, the top one, um, it's called what we call the ACAR. So it's a, 
um, communication system that is on board the plane that usually you can have some uh, input from your airline. But if your plane has an issue, it starts sending messages to the management uh, of the MRO to, to repair the plane so that when you land, the people on the ground know exactly what they will have to do. But in some very specific case, for example, for example here, it was the Egypt Air crash uh, about five or seven years ago. And in this crash, the plane sent messages to say that we have issues with the heading system from the windscreen, we have, we have smoke on board. And of course, when uh, Egypt claimed that there was a bomb on board the plane because the Paris uh, airport was not safe enough and that we had a bomb coming through, of course, we knew it was fake because we had those information that were uh, shared by the plane itself. Oops, sorry. Another example on the uh, bottom left um, is uh, the MH370. They shared something for the families. They shared pictures from the radar, military radar, primary uh, information about the radar. And just people took pictures of it and managed to identify the frequency and managed to identify where the plane went. And it, it, it helped uh, the, invest the official investigation. I will uh, focus on this a bit later. And of course, you have the official investigations. For example, when you look at the data that you can collect, here is an example about the, the Russian plane that, uh, was, uh, that, that suffered a, an, um, a bombing uh, in Egypt a few years ago. And just thanks to the uh, satellite image, we managed to identify that you had several spots on the ground. It means that the plane was not fully... Uh, it, it, it crashed on board, it, it exploded on the, on the, on the sky. <laughs> Sorry. And instead of being one crash site, you had multiple crash sites. It means that there was an explosion on board the plane. So I will focus on a few examples. The first one is just about pure OSINT. So it's a crash of Sriwijaya. So we have the picture of the plane that crashed. We have information about it. It's a Boeing 737. We know who owned it before. It was Continental, United, etc. Uh, we have the, when was it, uh, what are the kind of engines that you have? It's really, really interesting because I don't know who used it before the crash, but people are fond of finding these informations. After that, you can check, of course, at the weather informations. You know where the crash occurred. You know that there were no issues with the weather. It didn't cross, for example, a thunderstorm. But most interesting is the information that every fraction of second, the plane sends data about its speed, its height, and its direction. For example, here we see that the plane, at that very precise moment, of course, it had a loss of altitude. What can it be? And so you can analyze, make strong analysis, just thanks to the informations. We had this uh, trajectory. And those are the raw data before they were uh, used and transformed into those maps. But you can see, for example, up, uh, you can see the rate of descent, the instant rate of descent. When you lose 3,000 feet per minute at this very specific moment, it means that your plane, it's not just a descent that you uh, push on, on your joystick. It means more than this. So they make analysis. They, made, they had a 3D reconstruction of it. And thanks to the evolution of the angle of the plane at different moments, they knew that the plane had a problem uh, with the horizontal panel. Basically, the, didn't, the, the two engines didn't uh, had the same thrust. And so the plane went on the back. And that, this is how you can explain a 60 degrees descent rate. 60 degrees angle of descent. It doesn't exist usually. So it means that the plane went on the back and went down. But this information, usually you have to wait one month, two months to have this kind of information. Thanks to the crowdsourcing, thanks to those analysis, it was something like two hours after the crash, we had all those informations. 
So it's incredibly speed, and on that case, it was re reliable. Another one, very interesting case, is the MH370. Everybody heard about this plane. It disappeared in Southeast uh, Indian Ocean. We still haven't found it. Maybe it will start again in a few months, uh, a new investigation campaign. But basically, people helped a lot. First, there was um, a platform called Tomnod. And in the beginning, we thought that the plane had disappeared in the north uh, along Thailand. So they just took all the satellites that were there, they took pictures on the water, and asked for people, everybody who wanted to take part of this investigation, was able to look at a picture, and if you see something strange, a floating device, sometimes, sometimes people just made mistakes between waves, and, but basically, they found lots of floating pieces. Everybody was able to go on that website, spend five minutes, one hour, two hours on this website, and identifies this kind of things. So this is, in my opinion, the most massive crowdsourcing investigation ever made. The fact is that a few days after that, we realized that the plane had kept flying for seven more hours, so it was not the right position. But basically, the fact that randomly people choose to buy those pictures and share them widely, it was in 2014, it was really new. After that, we, we understood, thanks to the, those analysis, because the plane kept exchanging with the satellite, and they managed to define that the plane kept moving. The satellite asks the plane, are you still in my uh, coverage area? For example, your, your cell phones, the antenna asks you, are you still around? And maybe every five minutes, the antenna just gives you, allocates you, a range of capability to communicate. And so every hour, the satellite was asking the plane, are you still around? The problem is that the area comes from Australia up to France. So this is not precise enough. But when the satellite asks a question, the time that you take to answer, it's uh, electronic, of course, it will give me a distance. If you make one billionth of second or two million billionths of seconds, it's not the same distance. And so they managed to have seven distance between the satellite and the plane at seven moments of uh, the disappearance of the plane. But it was not precise enough. And this is how collective intelligence and crowdsourcing was amazing. First, there was an astrophysicist called Duncan Steele who said, yeah, but the satellite at that very specific ping, it was in the shadow of the Earth. So it means that it was a bit colder than usually. So maybe it will reduce the speed of his answer by a few percent. Okay. But when you have a few percent, and it, we are talking about hundreds of kilometers away. And secondary, okay, it's a geostationary satellite, it doesn't move but you have micro oscillations. So they had to integrate those micro, um, micro oscillations. And they added another way of being more specific. And then you had geographs who said, okay, but the earth is not round. It's not flat, okay? It's still round. <laughs> it's not pointy, but on the, it's not as uh, sphere as, uh, as we liked. And it was not as round as in the model. So once again, they managed to um, update and upgrade and improve the final position of the plane. I'm pretty sure that we missed the plane by 10, 15 kilometers. We know for sure now that the plane uh, arrived at this position because uh, first we have the radar data that were shared. Everybody now has access to the raw data. Everybody, everything has been analyzed a second and a third time. Uh, the Australian um, equivalent of the French uh, CNRS made very interesting investigation to be able to identify the rate of fall of the plane at the end, just to prove that the plane was not uh, piloted at the end when it was falling. For example, when we started to... Uh, oh, well, fuck, I don't have the first picture. 
in uh, July 2015, something like that, you had the first pieces that arrived in, um, in the French island La Réunion. 18 months after the deeper end of the plane, we managed to have a piece. And there was a journalist there who sent me this picture because I was already talking in the news about the crash usually. So he knew me and he sent me this picture. And I shared it with my friends and we had a pilot, we have an engineer, and one of them managed to identify that this piece that we see on the right is the piece of a flapron. And so I put on my uh, blog, nobody read my blog usually, but when I, I shared this, I went on CNN everywhere. And this is the way to identify that, yes, we found a piece of a Boeing 777 on La Réunion Island. And so you people made amazing analysis to identify where it came from. Some of the shells that you see on the top here, some very amazing guys managed to identify that it was a very specific kind of uh, crustaceous uh, shells. Shell. <laughs> uh, and so it means that when they made an analysis about the carbon of it, they managed to identify if it was in the cold water in the south or in the hot water more in the north. And so they added some precision about the position of the plane thanks to those analysis. And so this in crash investigation is absolutely amazing because of course you have all the specialists of the world, but the fact that it was completely open data, lots of other people just added their input and had new ideas. And today the investigation, we still haven't found the plane. I'm sure one day we will have the answer, but the investigation wouldn't have been the same uh, if we didn't have all those open data and this community, the world community, that worked to it. For example, you have someone, uh, Blaine Gibson, Blaine Gibson dedicated years of his life to gather the pieces of the plane. He paid people in Madagascar to go on the beach and find if you find something that looks like a piece of a plane. For example, this piece of the plane called the no step when they when they first shared the the picture the zoom pictures of uh, this piece of wreckage we saw that the holes of the screw it was not destroyed uh, arraché fuck I, I lost my english sorry just because of the vibration the holes got bigger and the vibration make it go away so it means that the plane dismantle in flight before it reached the surface of the water. Before it was officially recognized by the official investigation. Okay. For example, if you look also at another signal, when the plane emits signal, first it stopped sharing si signals and then it started again. The frequency of the signal was not exactly the one that, that we expected before. And this signal was saying I had um, an electrical failure. Okay, but so it comes back, it says, okay, it's an initialization from zero because I had an electrical failure. So electrical failure, but the frequency was not exactly the one that we were expecting. One of the explanation is that the plane maybe suffered a decompression and when it's minus 50 degrees, once again, it's colder and the frequency is not the same. And on the next hours, when it gives the signal again, it, it was hot again and the signal was correct, the frequency of the signal. And now the most challenging, the MH17. So first, you know the MH17 it was the beginning of the war in Ukraine when Russia first invaded Ukraine in 2014 and in the Donbass there was a plane uh, from um, Netherlands, from uh, Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur that was going by and that was destroyed in this uh, area. There were two options. The Russians claim that the plane had been attacked by an Ukrainian fighter called the Sukhoi-25, which is stupid because the Sukhoi-25 flies slower and lower than the Boeing 777. But okay, let's figure out this. And so the Russians were very good in open source investigation because they were sharing videos, they were sharing screenshots of their radar. It was interesting. 
And for example, the problem is that when you look at the holes that we can find, thanks to once again the witness, you see that the holes doesn't don't fit with uh, the, the shooting from a Sukhoi 25. So first, and in the beginning, that's, that's how I entered my war against Russia at this, uh, in this time, because I was making just pure 100% scientific analysis. And the problem is that the um, Ukrainian embassy was sharing my blog uh, post, and so the Russians, I was the, the target. So they put my blog away. It was a bit complicated in, in the beginning. And after that, Russians kept um, spreading disinformation. For example, maybe you've seen these, these uh, pictures before. It was officially shared by the Scientist Organization of Russia. And on the low right here, you have this Sukhoi 25 that shoots a missile on the poor Boeing 777 that is here. We found 32 mistakes in these uh, pictures, in this editing. First, the map is a Google Maps. Okay, so it was easy to identify. This plane is a Boeing 767 and not a, tr a 777. Um, the shootings come from the right and the plane was hit from the left. So you have lots of things that, okay, guys, try to cheat correctly. Try to be good <laughs> when you make mistakes. After that, Russians try to explain, okay, finally, finally, after months and years, they say, no, okay, it was not a Sukhoi 25. Yes, it was a book missile, a system coming from the ground, but it was not ours, and we have the evidence. So they shared some piece of evidence to show that the bad Ukrainian whoa, were in the area. And so, for example, they shared this kind of um, satellite pictures who could say that there's a problem with it? Bellingcat. Maybe you know Bellingcat. They're amazing. Everybody knows Bellingcat here. Usually you have to, pay to spend five minutes to explain who is Bellingcat. We are saving time. And so, for example, if you look on the left here, you see here there's a tiny place where the trees were cut. Where is it? Okay. And the problem for the Russians is that those pictures are made a different timeline. For example, here, end of May, uh, beginning of June, and you see the evolution. So it means that the time that they claim was taken, the picture was not correct. It was taken before. And you have lots of other information. I didn't zoom everything. But for example, on this parking lot, you have a, a car that have a leak of oil. And this leak of oil, you can see when it occurred. And the leak of oil is not on the Russian picture, and it should have been on the Russian picture. So it's an evidence that the Russians were sharing fake, um, fake satellite images. You have other ways to use it. Uh, you know photo forensics and all those uh, uh, tools, free tools that we can use online. For example, here, they shared those pictures, but we had the capability to prove that they were not even uh, able to um, to hide the fact that they m just copy and passed the, s the cars from uh, another picture. Okay, so those were fake uh, cars that they had it on it. But basically, okay, Russians are lying. This is not the first time, this is not the last one. But who shot that plane? And first thing, we had pictures from the launch site from a, uh, a ground-to-air missile, def air defense missile, that shot down the plane. That's what everybody was claiming, and this is what we could understand looking at the wreckage of the plane. So, for, so we had those, uh, the, shot, the shot here, and we have some kind of uh, cloud, but they made the analysis of the original picture, it was not uh, modified, etc. And at the same time, you had lots of witnesses who saw a book missiles coming away, dash cams, from, for example, from a team uh, from a um, newspaper uh, Paris Match, and lots of other uh, witness. For example, here you have the book coming out. Up, oh, fuck, where is the pause? 
Okay. I can't have it. Well, there's only three missiles instead of four on the top of it. It means that one missile has been used. It's confirmed it is the right one. And so we have lots of pictures of this book that we think had shot the plane. And we managed to have a rec reconstruction of his, uh, his way out of the crime scene. But we also managed to have lots of details about it. For example, we knew it was the 3 mm -mm -mm, 2 3 uh, 12 uh, 312 22 or 32 we didn't know it and so internet and the worldwide community decided to gather all the pictures that we can find about those three books yeah, there, you have hundreds of them for example the 312 the 322 and the 332 and you have hundreds of them so you can identify details for example you have two kind of wheels on those book missiles for example it can be spoke or hollow so the bad one the one we know that shot we see exactly what was the pass and we can compare it the 312 the 322 doesn't fit and 332 it fits there was for example here there was um, a shock on it and they can compare both of the book which one had the problem it was once again the 332 you have those wires how are, are they attached uh, to the book and so they made comparison once again it was the 332 so it was an amazing work that I managed to do with uh, smoke uh, and uh, a uh, oil uh, on some places of it. And you can compare everything. And just if you look at the numbers, you see that how it's written, it looks like the 332 once again. So at the end, we had a match. We knew it was a 332. But the Russians, they claimed that that book was an Ukrainian book that was used by the separatists and shot by the separatists. It was not them, of course. They are never guilty. They are the Russians. So um, we followed, we, hundreds of people, thousands of people, tried to follow this book and its convoy. convoy. And so, luckily, Google uh, Satellite Google Maps just took a picture at the right time of the convoy, the, 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 tr the truck, with all the, the cars before and after it. And we have lots of data that can prove that before the shootings, the book number 332 was in Russia. And it came from Russia. Because you have TikToks and all these kind of things that are shared widely, and you can prove that it came from Russia, and we have all the places at the end of June, uh, and the shot occurred, uh, I think, the 17th of July. So we had the evidence that it came from Russia. And of course, after that, who shot? Who gave the order? Who were the leaders of uh, this, uh, uh, this crime? And you know that Ukraine was gathering lots and lots of um, communications and they shared thousands of communications that they had gathered on the past few days because they didn't have time to listen to everything and they say okay please internet help us and so they managed to identify that some of the people were talking on the radio or talking on the cell phone and for example there there's a very famous exchange when uh, the guy says okay but are you sure it's a civilian plane yeah yeah we have lots of uh, uh, civilian clothes oh fuck okay and the problem is that the top leader Igor Girkin had already shared uh, the picture of the smoke and said yeah we hit uh, the, uh, an Ukrainian uh, plane so he, he said no my uh, account was hacked it was not me okay this kind of bullshit and they, analyzed, they made analysis, and it was an American um, university that made an analysis about the voice, the recording of the voice of the people, and they managed to prove who was talking 
who was on the ground, who was on the um, talkie walkie, and who was on cell phone. And at the end, the open source investigation managed to identify those people. And when you, when you compare it to the official investigation, it's exactly the same people. All the investigation from the people who gave the order to shoot the plane up to where the, the, the book came from, everything was open on the internet. And in my, op in my uh, knowledge, it's the first time that an open source team, Bellingcats, was officially invited to explain how they managed to have all this information to the uh, government to help them, to give them all the information. And of course, it was taken into account uh, for the official investigation. And I was too fast. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have any questions? Where is the MH370? <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> J'ai pas de micro. To understand Hello. when Hello. we talk about like so malware have... analysis or linear regression, etc. Very ah. common models that I just want to show here. And again, I don't have time to talk about all of them, but what? I just want to show this so that in the future, when we have time to research on our own, you know, if you don't know which models to, to research, well, let's start with these. Where are you? Okay, so if we're talking about machine learning models for classification, then we kind of have two main types of machine learning that we're going to talk here, and that's like your supervised learning and your unsupervised okay. learning. So with my supervised learning... Um, so I got a quick question about uh, the plane of Prigozhin. We, we saw, I think, months ago, uh, the plane was destroyed. Uh, have, you, have you made a few investigations about this plane? And do you have some infos about this? Because I saw quick investigation on Twitter and more, and we don't know if this uh, plane was already um, destroyed by the Russian government or another entity. So do you have uh, so some investigation about that? Uh, so it's a question about the plane that was, the, that, uh, you know, Prigozhin, his plane sh was uh, destroyed, okay? The official claim is that uh, they were drunk on board, they had a fight, and someone just sent a grenade. And so this is how the plane was destroyed, according to the official investigation from Russia. Okay. <laughs> and for the first time, even it was an Embraer plane, even the, the Brazilian investigation team was not allowed to take part in the investigation. Uh, does, do I have internet? I have a very nice source of information. It's my Twitter account. Okay. <laughs> so I just want to show to share you a picture. Oh, but my connection is quite low. And so, in the very beginning of the crash, we had very, very interesting pictures. Two of them. The first one is that the plane lost its wing. You don't lose uh, your wing just because you had a decompression. It's a heavy piece of the structure and you can't lose it. And the second problem is that you have the cloud that fits, wait, the cloud that fits with the fingerprint of a air defense system, probably a TOR. We, we investigated and we looked at tens of explosions of TOR missiles and it looks exactly like that. Wait, I'm just going to show you the, this picture. Uh, this is the, this one. Ah, oh, fuck, it doesn't work. Ah, parce que ça marche avec les PowerPoint? Non, je suis toujours sur HDMI. Ok. Okay. You see this cloud on the top left with the gray shape of arrow is super specific of a TOR missile. So of course it was shot down 
it's more interesting than falling from a stair or having problem with your window or drinking tea. This is more fun. Okay, but uh, of course it was the plane was shot down uh, by the Russians. It was 100 percent sure. Even if people keep uh, saying yeah, there was a bomb on board, uh, it's the Ukrainian. No, this was shot down by a, probably a Tor missile. Any other question? Yeah. Yes. Hello. Uh, thank you for your great presentation. Uh, I have a question concerning the the, so the the confidence that you can have on the evidence that you can found, and um, if AI is helping you on that, or at the opposite, uh, it can create some false evidence so that it's yeah, very easy today to create uh, images. Or today, I will be less confident of the v validity of pictures that are shared. Five, ten years ago, we didn't have a question about the about the picture because AI didn't exist. And when someone was fake, we just identify it like like that. So it was really easy. Today, for example, this video about Prigozhin, if it didn't come from uh, a known account that shares anything say, for years, the the girl who shared the picture was making a um, crepe the day before on the kitchen. So it's someone that exists, you know, it's not someone that makes uh, bullshit. Uh, uh, for example, from Givigenum, if you look at the information that are shared by some news network or some very specific canal, fuck, you know that they spread this information for 10 years, you know. For example, on uh, MH17, uh, and I switch back to this one, the Russians claim that um, a Spanish air traffic controller uh, so that the, the, the Ukrainian uh, fighter jet had shot down the plane. Why not? But this account, it was Spain, called Spain Buka, and this account was spreading disinformation for months and years, even before the beginning of the war, so they, uh, they were involved in this for years. And after that, of course, if the, the source is weak, you know, in the intelligence service, they use a letter for the quality of the source and the number regarding the credibility of the information. So the source was uh, D or E and the information was uh, 5. So it's the worst. The first one is A1 and the worst is uh, D5 or E5. So in this position, you can look also on the credibility of the source. And sometimes this is a bit complicated. For example, my uh, I was hacked. My YouTube channel was hacked. I still didn't recover my Facebook account. It has my name. It, now it spreads uh, information about um, the BR. I don't know. I don't give a shit about, about BR. But maybe one day they will say something about Ukraine that will go against my, uh, my interest. I don't know. I'm still fighting for two months with uh, Facebook. YouTube, it was like uh, 24 hours. And Facebook, I still don't have any answer. So maybe one day someone, not famous, but someone uh, uh, reliable, will have his account hacked just to be able to share some fake information the day after that. So it's on another weak spot. We have, of course, the AI, and we have the hacking of reliable accounts. Other questions? Nobody? No? Well, Xavier, thank you very much. Merci à tous.